All right, Joel Gostin here from joelgostin.com. I've been looking forward to this conversation for uh, quite a few days now. I'm very excited to welcome um, somebody as a fellow New Englander I've always been quite intrigued with artistically. Uh, she's a longtime musician, uh, best known for her work in the band's Galaxy 500, as well as her long-running project, Damon and Naomi. In addition to that, she is a graphic designer, video director, and filmmaker, which will take up most of the conversation to come. Uh, without further ado, it's my great honor to welcome Naomi Yang. Naomi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, any one of the things I just mentioned, as far as your professional pursuits, we can do an entire video just on Galaxy 500. We can do one on Damon and Naomi. Um, there's a lot to, to sort of explore there. But I wanted to focus on one thing in particular, which would be your recent feature-length uh, film debut as a filmmaker, uh, the film called Never Be a Punching Bag for Nobody. Uh, I saw it for the first time. I've seen it several times since, uh, a couple of weeks back, and it really blew me away. Uh, for one thing, it made me cry, which I wasn't expecting to <laughs> have happen. Um, and I kind of found out about it in an interesting way. I was doing a deep dive into my record collection one night, and I reacquainted myself with the band Big Dipper, uh, another Boston-centric band, of course. And I thought, I wonder if Big Dipper has a Facebook page. And of course they do. So I was going through that. And I noticed they had posted about your film. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And they put the link up and recommended it. And my first thought was, Naomi Yang did a movie about boxing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hard thing to sort of reconcile, right. but that piqued my interest. And I saw that it was, you know, generally 64 minutes, you know, not a, super long film I'm like okay i can i can commit some time to watching this and i've never seen a film in my life that says so much in such a short period of time uh it's a story about boxing of course it's a, a history of boston logan airport and east boston um there are other things as well you explore in the film um so I, I and my risk here is I don't want to give away too much about the <laughs> conversation. I want people. To it's definitely it. it's definitely a, a hard movie to to summarize because it it does kind of wander around all different things. But um, hopefully by the end you see that they are you know interconnected. Absolutely, so and it, it definitely it definitely has been um, was a, a challenge as I was working on it, and people are like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Well, it's this film, and it's about." boxing and about the airport and about East Boston and you know some personal stuff too so absolutely and whenever I thought I had figured out what I was watching like okay it's a movie that's going to tell me about Logan Airport which at different times in my own career I've had to travel out of you know 20 plus times a year so I know that area quite well mm -hmm. but I didn't know much about it so that fascinated me. So I, I was drawn in that way. And then the film takes in a completely different direction. You know, so there's so much to take in. And I was even telling a friend yesterday about the film. And he said that all that happens in 64 minutes. I'm like, yeah, all that happens in 64 minutes. 64 minutes is actually like a long time. Like, it's funny because, you know, um, you think of a, of a, of a feature late film as, you know, an hour, 20 minutes at least. But, you know, if you're, if you're building and editing um, a film, like, you know, every 15 seconds is, is actually a long time. <laughs> so it, it's kind of, um, I, I think like if you're on the other side of it, it's like, oh God, I made it to, it's over an hour. It's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, the, the sort of set the, set the stage of how the film came to be uh you you are a video director um you've done videos for for example lee ronaldo from sonic youth um so you've done that work already and from what i understand you were scouting a location for a fashion video you were shooting mm -hmm. and you came across a boxing club in east boston 
um, run by a very colorful and interesting man by the name of Sal Bartolo Jr., uh, who's uh, very quickly becomes a major focus of the movie. Um, I have to ask, what was your initial impression of Sal when you met him, when you first approached him to possibly film something at his club? Um, well, the, the initial encounter was um, he was really negative about the whole idea, um, but, you know, clearly very proud of his gym. And um, I just, I mean, I guess to like back it up a little, working um, as a musician, but always taking photographs, um, I started doing music videos about 10 or 12 years ago because um, I sort of had this uh, idea that it was a wonderful way to keep collaborating with musicians um, and use photography. Um, it was sort of like another way of of um, working on one of you know working on someone else's band for you know being in someone else's band for one song, um, mm -hmm. except from sort of a visual point of view. And um, so that was something that I really really enjoyed a lot and. Um, it, it, you know, it lets me have the opportunity to sort of dip in to other people's bands and their visions. Um, but I also work with um, a friend, um, Gary Graham, who's a fashion designer. And um, I we, we did a bunch of collaborations for videos for his uh, line of clothing. And there was one and he that we were going to do. And he said, I really want to find some locations that have really good, interesting sounds, um, because I want the 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 story in the in the video is going to be the model is doing field recordings, and um, so she, we want to photograph her in places that there are interesting sounds because that's where she would be recording, and so I was going all over Boston looking, and you know I had been to East Boston a little bit because as you mentioned it that's you know where the airport is, and you know once you know, I had a, a bag that got destroyed by an airline and they sent me to a, like a luggage repair shop in East Boston. And once we had a really delayed flight and we had like a great meal in East Boston because <laughs> we just left the airport. And, you know, but I didn't really have a, quite a sense of it, but I had this sense that it was an interesting area. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll start looking for locations there. And that's why I was driving around um, there looking for locations. And that's how I came upon the gym. And when I saw a boxing gym, I thought, oh, well, that's going to have interesting sounds. It would be, you know, sounds of punching. So that's what made me go in to ask if I could use it for the video location. And, you know, um, as I say in the movie, Sal initially was like, no, you, you know, go away. This is a gym. And... Uh, <laughs> I don't want you taking pictures here. And uh, as the film unfolds, you um, do return and you end up uh, becoming a participant in the club to where you're going five nights a week. And right. you build this very interesting relationship with Sal. And I, I love, I've never met Sal, but I love him because. Yeah. <laughs> He's uh, definitely a fan favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I grew up in um, very blue collar neighborhoods in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, so he's like 90% of the people I grew up around uh, <laughs> sort of approach to the world. And, you know, he's a tough guy. There's no question about that. But he's a real tough guy because he's a sweetheart. You know, I've yeah. always found that the guys who are strutting around telling you they're a tough guy, they have too much to prove. Mm -hmm. Cal wakes up tough. He's got nothing to prove. So he can be a nice guy, you know, and he just seems to have this warmth and a lack of pretense about him mm -hmm. that drives much of the film. And, and I can I can very easily tell why you became involved in sort of his culture and his studio. Yeah, he uh, tricked me into taking up boxing. <laughs> and again, I, I started watching the film and within the first 15 minutes, I thought, okay, this is going to be about Naomi meeting this gentleman and going to his club and learning boxing. Then it becomes this greater history of Logan Airport. Um, and, and specifically, and, and I had no concept of this prior to seeing your film. Um, you really dive into the, you know, in many ways, devastating impact 
the airport has had on those communities right by it. Um, and as much of a tough guy as Sal is, um, there's probably an even tougher person in the film, um, Mary Ellen Welsh, mm -hmm. um, who was very active in sort of working to address issues that were coming up in the neighborhood, you know, displacement and uh, people losing the sense of their communities because of this monstrosity of a business that was coming through. Um, I, I did want to certainly mention a bit about her because she has passed away. Uh, she passed in 2019. Um, tell me a little bit about her group, which was the Maverick Street Mothers and the impact they had on the community. Um, well, this was in the 1960s, and it wasn't just um, Mary Ellen Welsh. It was um, many of the women in the neighborhood who were um, had organized together um, and to try and um the the airport was expanding and was taking um houses by eminent eminent domain and um was also just in general um incredibly noisy and and not being um uh conscious that they were basically a, an airport inside a residential neighborhood um and they were building the airport and expanding the airport so um it was a bunch of the women in the neighborhood decided to organize together too. And I had I had no idea of this history and it wasn't until I started being in East Boston and being at the gym a lot and just kind of got intrigued about the neighborhood. And I started just sort of looking into some of the history of the neighborhood that I, I found this very rich um, and long history of activism uh, in East Boston and, um, as a sort of a community that you know has always been uh, very easily um, um, taken advantage of because it wasn't always people with a lot of power, and you know it was seen as as easily displaced. Um, and so there's a really long history of activism, and it and it still continues because there are still airport issues. Um, there's still um, uh, all sorts of environmental justice issues in the neighborhood. So it's actually a, a long history. Yeah, un un unfortunately. Um, but I found her just fascinating and, and her willingness to represent her community and, and work with others to have that voice. Um, one thing I really admire about your work in this film is your storytelling is very matter of fact um and you treat you know the the wise guys who come up uh with the same level of non-judgment as you do the the neighborhood mothers mm -hmm. you know who, who marched and and protested so i i really find that admirable as well um you know it, it is interesting because I, i'm a writer predominantly and a good friend of mine a fellow writer who passed on a few years back uh, Mike Hudson, who used to sing in the band The Pagans out in Ohio years ago, um, he used to always say very straightforwardly, writers write. If you're a writer, you're writing all the time. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. As a filmmaker, filmmakers film. Um, when did you realize that what you were recording would end up being a film? Um, well, as... Uh... As I explained in the film, I, I made I ended up being able to make the fashion video um, at the boxing gym, um, but I had become intrigued by boxing um, enough by then that I kept going back to the gym, um, and uh, I just really started. I really, I sort of that initial interest in the neighborhood just kept growing. And I was actually talking to a friend and telling her all about the gym and you know the, the the history of the neighborhood and the airport and the activism around it that I had just discovered, you know, just for my own um, interest. And um, she's like, "Oh, these are so many interesting stories. Why don't you you should just?" And I was like, "Yeah." And I'm I'm sorry not to just keep filming there because it's beautiful. I, I love the. You know, I love the landscape. I love the the ocean there and the strange industrial 
poetry. And she's like, well, why don't you just keep filming? And I was like, yeah, you know, I think I'm just good. I'm there anyway, I'll just keep filming. And so I just kept filming things that were interesting to me and I kept doing research, but I had no idea how any of it, I was not like, I didn't have like a plan. I didn't say like, I'm gonna make a movie about this and it's gonna be this. I just was filming and I was filming the boxing gym and I was filming the airport and I was looking up things in the Boston Public Library and digging in these archives. And then I was like, I don't know how any of this goes together. <laughs> you know? um, but then I started writing the narration. I started like, well, let me just write and, and see, you know, what, it, what is this, what are all these things? And um, as I started writing it, it started kind of becoming clearer to me, like why these things were interrelated. Um, and then I was more, I started more consciously um, realizing that I was making something, but it, 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 it didn't start out that way at all. It just was like, I just still like, I mean, I, there are all these crazy airplanes flying overhead really low all the time. And it looks so weird and it's so strange and I, it's cool. <laughs> I don't know. So it was, it kind of, it came together in the writing and I really also didn't know how it was going to end. I was like, well, what's the end of this? Like, is this a story? And it kind of, I sort of had to figure it out as I wrote it. Mm -hmm. So it is the opposite of something that where you would like write a grant proposal and say, this is what I'm researching and this is what it's what it's going to be about. Um, it, I I had to figure it out like as I was making it. So, and, so I'm pretty happy I finished it because you know it was like I didn't know if it was going to become something or not. Hmm. How long did it take from the time you first met Sal to when the, the film was done and dusted? Um, well, there was a little pandemic in the middle um, when I stopped going to the boxing gym. The boxing gym did not close. Um, Sal just put curtains up in the window so that no one would see he was still having a boxing gym. <laughs> um, but I think I started shooting it in like, around 2017, 2018, the end of, I, mean, I made the fashion video in 2017. I started sort of really filming it for my own reasons in 2018. And um, it came out last, last spring. So like four or five years of just going to the gym and, and filming and figuring out. And sometimes Sal would shut me down. Sometimes he'd be like, you know what? I'm, I'm tired of you filming, I used too distracting you know, and he wouldn't let me film in the gym for six months. And yeah. I would still go boxing and, but I, I wouldn't bring my camera and I wouldn't, you know, ask to. And then, you know, eventually I'd be like, hey, can I film this? And then he'd be like, oh yeah, sure. Like, <laughs> sure, that's <fine>. so, <laughs> you know, it was just kind of like a, you know, and I, and when, when that happened, I would just take my camera and I'd be filming outside in the landscape. I'd be like, okay, well, you know, it, I don't even know what I'm making anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, as I said earlier, uh, one thing that really captivated me about the film is I, I, I didn't know what I, the film I would be watching would take me next. You know, it's it, it changes direction quite a bit. Um, and, and I'll kind of opine very briefly, I assure you, and then I'll, I'll get into my question. Um, I think anyone who has the ability to communicate through filmmaking, uh, writing, music, art of any kind, what have you, we have an obligation to tell the truth. And in telling the truth, if we're lucky, we may end up showing, you know, making the world feel less alone in the process, you know, um, if we're fortunate enough to see that happen. And about 40 minutes in, the film takes a very different direction and you discuss your childhood. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for doing that. Uh, you certainly uh, met an empathetic audience with myself. Um, having said that, what was the level of difficulty for you in, in A, knowing that it was important to include that in the film and B, being able to present it um, in such a brutally honest way um well i think like level of difficulty if it's like one to ten ten being the most difficult i'd say 
it was 11. <laughs> and uh, I just, I, um, you know, that's a point in the film where I go into some personal history that was really something I hadn't spoken about publicly. And I understood it was definitely a part of the reason that I got so interested in boxing. Um, but I was very reluctant to put it in the film because I thought so often people talk about, you know, trauma that happened in their lives. And then that becomes the whole, the whole story, the whole subject. And I didn't want to be, have, having that be the subject of, of a film. And I also, um, yeah, I just felt like, almost like, you know, I guess it's sort of the leftover feelings of confusion about it. Like, I don't even know if this is worth sharing. Um, and so I really went back and forth about it. Um, I wrote the part for myself. Um, but I really wondered about including it. And I actually even, um, I I took a non-scientific poll of some of my closest friends who, you know, did know about me and my family history. And um, I was like, well, should I include this or not in my film? And I was, I thought I would just get like a uh, everyone would just agree and tell me yes or no. They'd be like, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Or, oh, you must do that. And, you know, I thought I, it would be a consensus. consensus. Um, but what was really amazing is there was no consensus. So I had friends on like way on either side, like friends that were like, you must include this. In fact, you should put this at the front of your film. This is like the most important thing. And then I had friends that were like, absolutely do not, do not go there. This like, the, you know, I, I, I don't care for documentaries that end up about like, the filmmaker's personal thing. And so I was like, oh, this is crazy. Like, I didn't get a consensus at all. I was like, oh, I guess I have to decide for myself. <laughs> and um, I just in the end, I felt like, you know, what I realized about my own personal history and um, why it made me so intrigued to take up boxing, um, was just, I mean, it was at the heart of the reason of why I was doing it. And that if someone said to me, like, you know, like if you said to me now and I hadn't included in the film, like, well, so, but what was it about boxing? Like, why, why did you keep doing it? Like, you know, that's so weird for you. Like you play this like, you know, quiet little music. That's, like, I mean, um, and uh, I was like, well, you know, I would have to say, oh, well, there's this whole, personal reason and I was like well that's ridiculous like if that is the reason at the heart of why this happened then if I don't include it in the film in some way I'm kind of leaving out this sort of crucial bit of information so I decided to include it you know at you know 40 minutes um just about my personal history and the connection that you know I realized that that had to why I really decided to keep doing boxing even when I didn't have to because I had finished shooting this film or yeah. this music video a fashion video sorry yeah. I just shooting the fashion video and I could have just been like okay that was great thanks for letting us use the gym goodbye and yeah. I was like no I'm going back well one of the beautiful ways it all sort of ties in you know these different directions you take it um, towards the end, you you say something. I I, I quoted it here. And I, I want to read it. Um, even if you can't win all the fights in the present, and even if you can't go back and win the fights of the past, you can find a way to use your fear. And um, you know, I get chills reading it. You know, it's but it it ties everything in because um, Mary Ellen used her fear. Mm -hmm of where her neighborhood was going. You know, you used your fear of addressing certain things that tied into the film, but in a very personal way. Um, so I walked away from the film just deeply moved and realized that um, 
it's not a it's not a movie about boxing. It, it's, <laughs> it's necessarily a movie about East, East Boston. I mean, those things are major elements, but there's something deeply human and and pure in what you uh, concluded with once the project was done. So, um, you know, I, I I'm just so delighted that this exists. Um, Thank you. Well, I mean, I mean, sort of going back to something that you mentioned that the top you know about um um uh, kind of like doing things to share things with people like you know making things and you know and that was always something that was very important to me in music it's just like the way music can really move you and make you feel connected and make you feel understood um, you know, like songs that you love and that you're just like, that really speak to you. And then as a musician, it's kind of this impulse, like I want to, you know, do that for someone else. Like I want to be able to make something that can be meaningful and, you know, bring, I don't know, beauty or comfort or you know understanding to other people the way the things that have moved me um I guess I felt like similarly in making the film was some sort of lessons for myself and I guess it was about you know trying to share what I had learned so I guess that was also why I felt like I had to you know be really honest in the film Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I must ask, uh, what did Sal think of the film? <laughs> um, I, you know, it was funny because I knew I was going to show it. He knew, obviously, that I was making a film. And, I, you know, it was hard. I, you know, and I kept saying to him, well, you know, it's not just about the gym because I didn't want him to be, like, taken aback. It was, like, all the stuff about the airport. And, you know, I didn't want him to be surprised in any way. And, you know, so I explained to him, things as I was learning them about the airport and about the protests and he vaguely remembered them. Um, you know, that, I mean, the, the, that history in East Boston, he wasn't that um, involved in it. But, um, and then, you know, as I was editing it, of course I knew he would see it, but it was not <laughs> until I like finished it pretty much. And I was like, okay, I'm going to show it to you now. And I like brought in my laptop to show him, you know, a, a, an edit, um, and that we started watching it together um, in this, his same office, the office that you see us watching boxing footage together, um, that was like, oh my God, he's really like watching it now. And it wasn't until that moment where I was like, oh no, <laughs> like what have I done? <laughs> um, but he watched it and I mean, it, it was amusing because the parts where, um, people are boxing and in the film he's critiquing their boxing and like you know talking to the screen he started doing it over himself talking so it was <laughs> like you know it's like I was boxing or someone was boxing in the, on the screen on the footage in the film and he's talking and like critiquing it and then in his office he starts critiquing it over like in real time um but he he would just at the end he was like yeah good job you know so you know, it was not like um, uh, it, it, he didn't hate it. He didn't hate it, and then he even agreed. He came to the premiere, which was at the Brattle Theater, mm -hmm. um, at the Independent Film Festival of Boston, and answered said the Q and A. He did the Q and A with me, and um, he also it was also shown in East Boston, and he came to that screening too and did the Q and A. So. He was a good sport about it. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, we should mention, of course, there is a soundtrack to the film available. Um, I know it's up on Bandcamp. Yes. Um, uh, was the music specifically conceived for the film or was it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I um, I wrote it for the film. I um, sat here at this same desk and I... Um, you know, I, I screened the film and I scored it for, you know, with the scene. So it was completely written for the films. And it was the first time I had written um, music 
just completely on my own, not um, with the band, um, and just did it like straight into my computer, and and I did the the editing. And um, I worked with a wonderful sound designer, Ian Koss, who um, you know helped integrate all the narration and all the um, the the live sound that I had and the music, and he did a beautiful job. Um, and he, he is a uh, actually a podcast audio designer, hmm. and I was really I knew that I wasn't going to necessarily have um, synced synced uh, audio, where you know like a, a, in, a, in a more con conventional documentary, you know you have like a talking head and someone's explaining something and you see them, and I I actually knew I didn't want that. I didn't want um, talking heads, hmm. um, so I. And uh, also um, there were people who I, I couldn't film, like I couldn't film Mary Ellen Walsh because she was very ill, but I could record her. So I knew I was, so I, I just knew I was gonna have these um, conversations that were audio only. And so I was like, okay, I wanna make a soundtrack that sort of can live on its own so that you know it's not, doesn't necessarily have to be synced because I knew I wasn't going to necessarily have syncing and I didn't know if I really wanted that. So I thought it was great to work with someone that just works purely in, uh, in uh, you know, radio without, that does audio design that doesn't necessarily have any images attached to it. Mm. That's excellent. Um, I know the film is currently available on various um, streaming platforms. Um, are there plans for a physical re release at this point in time? Um, you mean like a, like a DVD? Yeah, or something um, that no, I don't have I don't have any plans for that right now. Um, I think uh, I think yeah, I guess most people um, are streaming stuff now. I guess I don't know if if I made a DVD if anyone how many people would want it. Um, but yeah, it's on Amazon, um, and it's on some other. It's, I, I think it's like Stash TV is through YouTube maybe. And also on my own, on my Vimeo channel. Um, but it's, um, and there's some extras there. Um, but that's also where all my music videos live too. Excellent. You know, it's funny. I was speaking with someone last night about um, physical versus digital these days. Mm -hmm. And I know through, through what I'm doing here and, and my website, I get dozens of digital promos every week sent to me. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like so once in a while somebody will send me a CD mm -hmm. and it, it's like a time machine has come through <laughs> town. And I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? Right. <laughs> it's definitely a different age. When was the last time you bought a a, D, uh, a DVD? Uh yeah. So <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> I wouldn't even have one sale. <laughs> I just have the stack of them here in my office. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I do hope I can I can screen it more because that's a I mean, like for people because that's always been um, that was really fun and it was it I've done it a couple places and it really is amazing to um, you know get to watch it with the audience and hear people's response and you know it's much more like a, it's like a gig or something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so you're still boxing, I take it. You're still. I'm still boxing. Yeah. Still, still boxing at Sal's. I'm sure. Still boxing at Sal's. Yes. No, there's nowhere else I'd go boxing. Probably. <laughs> How's your push-up game these days? My what? Your push-up game. Oh, my push-up. It's still not beautiful. <laughs> it's better than it was. I'm trying to work on a pull-up now and I've gone from it being like one centimeter to being like one inch <laughs> it's so hard <laughs> well it's wonderful that Sal weathered the uh the pandemic and is still operating and <laughs> he got many cease and desist orders taped to his door <laughs> during that whole time I I'd imagine so yes yeah, he seems to start framing. <laughs> fantastic! I got to get down there sometime just to be <laughs> be fantastic. 
Um, you know, I'm curious because obviously as, as creative people, everything impacts what we do. You know, every, everything informs us in some way. And boxing has become uh, a major part of your life. And the philosophy of boxing, which you get into quite a bit in the film, and I'll, I'll leave that for the viewer to experience on their own. Um, how would you say boxing has most informed what you do now creatively, whether it's through film or through music or any other endeavor you're going through now? Mm. Um, well, I, I mean, I think of certainly the, the lessons from the film um, have, you know, that I sort of codified for myself by making the film have stayed with me. Um, and also I, you know, I now really uh, feel like if I'm not, you know, working out a lot, I, I feel like there's something missing. It's an incredible, I just really appreciate the physical, the physicality of it. And, and, um, and I don't know, maybe I'm much tougher, you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, looking ahead, uh, I, I guess the film's been out, you said the spring of last year. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're getting into the spring soon. Thank mm -hmm. God being New England people. We appreciate that. Um, what does the rest of your 2024 look like as far as projects and, and things in the works? Um, I am taking care of a bunch of other things that were neglected while I was finishing my film. And um, we are writing some new music and we're doing some shows and um yeah just sort of what what we always have done um i'm not jumping into trying to make a another film right away because that you know this film just kind of happened and it was so I, I, you know, people are like, oh, what's your next film? And I'm like, I, I don't know. And I don't even know, you know, will I make another film? I mean, it was a very unique thing that was a response to something, you know, that to, you know, being in that place and at that time. Um, so, yeah, we'll just see what happens. Excellent. Well, we you saw what would happen when you were making this film. So that that seems to work well, um, that philosophy. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to be in a band either. So, you know, <laughs> that's just what happens to me. Um, if I could, I did want to ask one music question. Um, mm -hmm. And as I said in the beginning, we could do separate videos on various different chapters of, of your creative life. Um, but I did want to ask a bit about Galaxy 500 because um, uh, to me, it's always been a special band in that you achieve something unique in that if people know the band, they know the band. You know, it's it's a it's a sense of discovery when people, I think, find the records now and they realize what you had done back then. Um, and, and clearly the band still has a, a an audience uh, globally for what you did. Um, which is kind of rare, you know, because there are a lot of bands, <laughs> past and present and future. No, no, I mean, I mean, we're very appreciative that you know we're we feel very in a very lucky position that people are still listening to to that music. I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, um, and it may be an intangible answer I'm asking from you, but what do you think it was about the band that made it work to the point where? within three albums you set a template and and you built something that continues to have its own life even now mm. oh, gee. you know i don't know i think it's uh luck i don't know i mean it, at the time it didn't feel, it didn't feel like there were many people doing what we were doing exactly like we were weird um you know it was you know right the moment that was like right before you know grunge hit and and you know it, it just we were weird we were quiet and um you know we worked with Kramer and he had a very eccentric producer um so I don't know. I just 
it just was, um, I don't know, luck. I, I mean, I think we were being true to trying to make them, I mean, we, you know, none of us were like uh, music school musicians. So we were just doing what we could do. And we were trying to, with what, what tools we had and what skills or you know, lack of skills we had, we were just trying to do something that felt like what we wanted to express. And, you know, I think we're, we're really lucky that um, it, people still want to listen to it. I mean, you know, at the time we were not very that popular. I mean, yeah, I mean, we were not, um, you know, we were playing shows and, you know, we had some reputation, but we, it, it, you know, it was a, a constant frustration to the record companies and the booking agents of, you know, that we were not, we were not huge. And, the, and, and so, you know, that's the thing now that I think, I don't know if people always realize, you know, like there were bands that were, uh, bands that at the time that, that were our um, colleagues that were just way, 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 way more popular that, you know, were on the covers of things. And, and you know, we had the, you know, the publicist in, in the London office, you know, disappointed because we didn't, we were supposed to be on the cover of the third most popular British Weekly and we got bumped, you know, and then we were like consoling her. So it, I don't know. I I feel like we're lucky. We're lucky that the music is still speaks to people, but um, it's, it's kind of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And I certainly um, don't want to disregard Damien and Naomi's discography. Um, some of my favorite albums are in there. Um, More Sad Hits, for example, and there's a rich musical history there. And, and I have to say, I've admired your work for years from afar. Um, and it was the film that really encouraged me to finally reach out and express that to you and had this great framework to chat about, um, you know, this recent endeavor you you completed recently, I should say, but it had been around for a bit. Um, I just can't tell you how moved I was by the film. I really appreciate you making it. Um we should have very best of luck with it. And I, I hope anybody watching this, please, when, when this video concludes, <laughs> rent and or buy the video and, and watch the film and, and get a great glimpse into what we've been chatting about. Um, and I hope with not only your vast history, but your future to come, we'll have other opportunities to touch base. Um, but in the meantime, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. My pleasure.